hij, hij, zo vanaf het eerste gesprek dat we hem uh, ontmoet hebben, toen heeft hij al gezegd, uh, ja, dit is zo mega, dit is zo super. Uh, dit leg heel de koep doet de wereld eigenlijk bad. Maar ja. Today we have the anomaly that is the Sloat Digital Coding System. A more recent invention that's seemingly been lost to time. Had this program been finished, it would have revolutionized information transfer with an extremely efficient way of handling data. It's no surprise, then, that the system's disappearance after its creator's sudden death has spurred countless conspiracies, becoming somewhat of an urban legend in the tech world. With the story having so many variations, it can be difficult to know just what happened. So then, what exactly was the Sloat Digital Coding System? Jan Sloat was but a simple family man from the Netherlands when he opened a television repair shop in the late 1970s. Though he had little formal education, Jan had a knack for tinkering with electronics. Unfortunately, he wasn't as skilled at running a business, filing for bankruptcy in his first five years. Jan wasn't discouraged, though, and moved his family to the small city of Neuachein to restart his business in 1984. Here he began offering repair work on a new technology catching on, home computers. Always looking for new ways to innovate, Jan began designing a system called RepaBase as a side project. This database would contain all relevant details about repair jobs nationwide for easy retrieval. As Jan was ironing out the logistics, he noticed low memory might be a setback. In navigating this, Jan's mind began toying with the broader concept of data storage. Jan's dedication to solving RepaBase's storage issues wound up overtaking any meaningful work on the system. Though he never completed the RepaBase project, he was now determined that highly efficient data storage could change the world. Roughly 11 years went by with Jan spending what little free time he had furiously working on his theory in the attic of his family home. As it turns out, this wouldn't involve high compression so much as a craftier way of transmitting information. But Jan had run into problems beyond just technological limitations. His obsession bankrupted his business and left him severely in debt. Yet he continued to stake everything on a project that could make or break his family and the pressure took a toll on the man's mental health. His son Ben recalls his father often falling asleep in the attic with a burnt out cigar still in hand, though nothing on the computer screen. Jan was paranoid that his revolutionary idea could be stolen from him, even warning Ben to be careful with who he talked to. Now convinced that his brain was the safest place to store his work, Jan's notes would emit the critical source code needed to make his machines work. Jan's secrecy impeded another crucial part of development, finding investors. He did secure two patents for his project, though these don't provide enough information to replicate Jan's work even today. This was partially because of his unconventional approach. Feeling binary was outdated, Jan opted to use a coding alphabet of his own design. He was able to convince two unlikely investors early on, Leo Mirop and Lean Moyart, neither of whom had a background in computer science. Both admitted they didn't have a clue of how the Slout digital coding system worked and that it was instinct guiding their decision to provide funding. The enormous toll development put on Jan's bank account, though, meant much more funding was necessary to finish the project. Assisted by a well-connected lawyer friend, Lean shopped around the concept to prospective investors. One investor named Bart Van Rienen signed on to the project after Jan Slout presented it to him and some security experts from the Oracle Computer Company, convincing them of its potential. The system itself was said to rely on storing the most basic components of image and sound in five separate algorithms, then reassembling the data and unique patterns needed to produce a feature-length movie. Jan said that these five algorithms together only added up to 370 megabytes, remarkably small given its potential. Believing assembly could be accomplished with a single key for each movie, Jan remarked that a lossless film could be called up with as little as one kilobyte of information. This meant that even the smallest computer chips could hold dozens of films, all at the highest quality imaginable. The best part was, all the components needed to build the device were inexpensive. But critics believe Jan overlooked an important detail. To fully render a movie, the keys would need to be extremely long. From a practical standpoint, there simply weren't enough numbers in the universe to represent a string of such complex data. The reaction from Oracle, however, affirmed Bart Van Rienen's belief that Jan was onto something groundbreaking. He quickly enlisted the help of René Bickel, a former director for World Online. With the backing of investor Marcel Buchhorn, the group reorganized under the name of Dipro. Even at this stage, Marcel felt the system would be worth at least a billion dollars and drew up a list of leading tech companies to contact. Since the discovery was made by a Dutch man, 
Bert Van Rienen felt that priority should be given to a Dutch company, so the team first prepared a presentation for Philips Electronics. The team managed to get its first meeting at Philips headquarters on March 11, 1999. On hand was the company's star engineer, Carol Jan Van Driel, and a prominent board member named Roel Piper. Expecting a rather bulky device, the representatives were astonished to see the prototype was roughly the size of a briefcase. Both remained skeptical as Jan enthusiastically showed off various features of his system. Checking the device for the sound of an internal hard drive, the experts confirmed they heard nothing. Still, the feasibility of the device was questioned by Carroll. Quote, We understand that one kilobyte on the chip card is sufficient to store the key code of a DVD title. Since a DVD title contains 19 gigabytes, we are concerned about the amount of ROM memory. Roll Piper, however, didn't seem as bothered by the questionable technology behind the coding system. He remained in touch with Marcel Buchhorn, who now realized it might make more sense for the team to publish the system themselves. Still, there were more meetings to be had with Philips Electronics. Jan Slout's apprehensiveness was becoming more apparent, though. He insisted the next meeting be held at a neutral location, as he was reportedly afraid that technicians at the Philips headquarters could find a way to replicate the device by simply viewing it. Part of Jan's neurosis stemmed from his meek personality. He was convinced that his device wasn't overly complex and that somebody smarter than him could easily figure out how it worked. Marcel Buchhorn thus arranged for the second meeting to be held at a local box factory. But the inventor's partners were finding it increasingly difficult to work with his erratic quirks. Of Jan's personality, Marcel once said, quote, Slout made an extremely paranoid impression on me from the start, which often made working with him more difficult. This defensiveness sometimes led Jan to lash out when questioned or criticized, out of a sense of being misunderstood. In this second meeting, Roel Piper was joined by more engineers from Philips, though Carol Jan van Driel was conspicuously absent. Jan proudly showed off that the device could play back up to 16 different movies simultaneously, an unlikely feat with 1999 technology. These other engineers seemed to share the skepticism of Carol Jan van Driel, and Mr. Slout's credibility was only further damaged by his refusal to answer questions. Roel still saw potential in the device, though, and insisted Philips give it consideration. But it seems Carol Jan Van Drill overruled Roll, and Philips elected not to pursue the Slout digital coding system. Roll is said to have gone ahead regardless, even risking his own career by joining Dipro while working for Philips for another two months. There's some debate over whether Roll Piper left Philips specifically to join Dipro or if he had already planned to, but he insists that parting ways was always his intention. Whatever the case, Roll rounded out the Dipro team as its CEO and immediately went to work cultivating a brand based around the company's vision. The idea that Roel Piper of all people was heavily involved with this project left leading Dutch computer scientists baffled. Unlike many of the early investors, Roel was already well versed in high-tech investments. Perhaps blinded by its incredible potential, he speculated the invention could be worth as much as 24 billion in just five years. Roel soon relaunched Dipro under the exciting name Fifth Force, a reference to the hypothetical fifth fundamental force of physics. Some of the promoted possibilities of the device included real-time video calls, greater energy efficiency, and the ability to download movies in just seconds. The next step was to shop Fifth Force around the world, starting in America. Roll Piper recruited investors and developers for Fifth Force and was planning on taking the company public by 2001. In May of 1999, he arranged to have the key members of the company brought to America to show off the device, which would supposedly make them billions. They first visited New York, which offered them a warm reception and many eager parties willing to invest. The team then returned to the Netherlands to plot their conquest of America's tech industry. Jan Slout was apprehensive about the next trip to Silicon Valley, complaining that he had hardly slept and that the stress was wearing on his weak heart. Because of his protectiveness over the coding system, the team would have nothing to show if Jan wasn't physically present. Marcel Buchhorn spent a week convincing Jan to lend him the invention, promising nothing would happen to it which, reluctantly, he agreed to. Roel Piper used his extensive contacts to get in touch with everyone from Rupert Murdoch to Bill Gates to push the system, eventually leading him to an old colleague named Tom Perkins who was incredibly enthused. But the lure of riches beyond anybody's imagination inevitably caused conflict when Roel persuaded Marcel Buchhorn to leave the Slout digital coding system with him in Silicon Valley for more wheeling and dealing, playing into Slout's fears that his device was being stolen from him. The first thing Jan did after getting his machine back was to check for tampering. He had sealed the screws with a lacquer to secure it against any attempts at reverse engineering. 
When it was learned that not only had the machine been opened, but also connected to some sort of device, Jan Slout's feelings of betrayal imperiled the entire project. Despite this attempt failing, Jan grew even more isolated from the team, trusting only his old friend Leo Mirop to handle the logistics of selling the device. Part of this stemmed from getting burnt before. Jan apparently had a different invention stolen from him on the eve of a lucrative deal. Roll Piper denied any involvement in trying to deconstruct the device, and it took Leo Mirop to convince Jan it was still worth going ahead with the deal. Though Roll Piper continued to drum up investment support in the Netherlands and abroad, there was now a wedge between Jan Slout and the company. He refused to let the machine go again until a contract was signed. For added security, all critical information about the Slout digital coding system was held between its owner and a trusted notary. Tom Perkins was amongst those highly interested in seeing the device succeed. Making the trip to the Netherlands from London, he arranged a July 9th meeting with Jan Slout to see the device and its creator in person. He and several others pledged millions of dollars to the project. Quote, My decision to help in the financing was the golden moment for the group. I studied Jan Slout. He was in a state of, well, bliss. That's the only word I can find to describe the expression on his face. He had labored in obscurity for 15 years, and at this moment all his dreams, all his plans and fantasies were coming true. He was literally the happiest man I had ever seen. Jan Slout was so overcome with emotion, he supposedly fell out of his chair upon learning the deal would go through. His worries were finally put to rest, and he spent the Saturday shopping with his family. Apparently Jan was in such good spirits, he even splurged and bought himself a $50 shirt. The plan was now set in stone. He'd hand over the most critical part of his device the moment he put pen to paper. For once it seemed fate was in the favor of Mr. Slout. But all this went out the window the day before the paperwork was to be signed. Leo Mirope received a most unsettling phone call from Ben Slout on July 11, 1999. His father had been working in the garden that morning when he collapsed from chest pains. Paramedics tried to revive him, but were unsuccessful. Jan Slout had died from a heart attack, aged 53. The news quickly spread amongst the investors, some of whom seemed more concerned about having lost their golden goose. A version of the machine was recovered, but to operate it it would need the compiler, which of course was Jan's most tightly guarded secret. Though the funeral was held July 14th, the ghost of Jan Slout and his discovery would linger around for a while yet. The surviving Slouts were understandably in shock following the death of the family patriarch, and unable to decide what to do next. The secretive nature of Jan meant even they couldn't verify the location of his compiler. Leo Mirop was left to organize Jan's affairs and what to do about the missing disc. He decided on hiring a 24-hour security service for the Slout household because in his words, quote, you can't leave $100 billion unattended in an attic. The family chose to go ahead with the deal after all, but there was still the issue of finding the compiler needed to work the device. Complicating the matters further was a bit of family drama. Jan's other son Johan had long thought of his father's invention as baloney. Jan had always taken this especially hard and probably would be furious to learn that only now his son was taking the idea seriously. There was also the arrival of Jan's estranged daughter, who hadn't been in contact with her family for years, yet showed up the day after her father's death to root through the attic for the source code. The two siblings apparently worked together to take 12 of Jan's binders and try and study his notes for a solution. Though the security team was aware of this and tracked them, they managed to escape. Nevertheless, no one found the floppy disk with Jan's compiler. While his widow and son Ben continued looking, Roll Piper assembled a team of computer scientists to try and crack the code through reverse engineering. He also hired private investigators to find the fabled disk. The Slout family home was literally torn apart, with even the garden being dug up to search for hiding spots. But alas, no one found the disk. And as it turned out, the Slout machine the engineers tried dissecting wasn't even the same one showed off in Silicon Valley. Not long afterwards, everyone involved started pointing fingers. Investors like Tom Perkins were putting pressure on Roll Piper, who in turn was trying to take greater control of Fifth Force. In Leo Mirope's words, quote, We hadn't yet left the cemetery when Piper claimed a 30% interest in Fifth Force from Bookhorn. He felt his role had become more important. Bookhorn and I put a stop to that. The family turned over what they could to investigators as the businessmen squabbled over who was owed what. Leo Mirope held out hope his friend's invention could be salvaged, but as time went on, this seemed increasingly unlikely. Then, a disturbing revelation came from the engineers. 
It seems there was, in fact, a hard drive installed in the machine they had access to. Ben Sloat insisted this was a temporary fix his father used for a broken computer chip, but still, this dealt a serious blow to the invention's credibility. Leo now recalled that Jan dropped off a document containing a massive amount of code to the notary in the days following one of his presentations. When the vaults were later searched, only a few basic prototypes were found. Even with tens of thousands of dollars poured into the investigation, the device brought to America couldn't be recovered, nor the disk containing Jan's source code. It was as though the Slout digital coding system disappeared, if it even truly existed. Roll Piper, who was by now effectively in total control of Fifth Force, began contacting investors like Tom Perkins to announce the project was being abandoned. As Roll wanted to move on from this costly ordeal, Leo Mirope grew more apprehensive of his motives with Fifth Force. He was particularly unsatisfied when Roll shot down his idea of having public prosecutors investigate the circumstances of Jan's death. Leo asked for at least an autopsy, which the family consented to, yet this never happened. Because Leo only had his own suspicions to go by, the matter wasn't followed up on. Eventually, everyone with a stake in the system found themselves worn out and sick of the ongoing sunk costs. The search for Jan Slout's invention had come to a rather anticlimactic finish. Even today, the Slout digital coding system remains a rare modern mystery yet to be solved. Given how many factors remain unclear, it's no surprise that the story has been ripe for all kinds of speculation. Some question whether the device existed as Jan Slout claimed, whereas others have clung to the unusual circumstances of his death just days before signing a billion dollar deal. The part role Piper played in the story has been scrutinized by those who don't understand his fixation with the ill-defined invention. And the very science of such a device remains tenuous, especially given Slout's sometimes cantankerous personality when questioned about specifics. Many interpretations of this anomaly are possible. But as of right now, there remains doubt over which one is correct.